Hi, friends. I'm going to share a story today that I have really only told once. And the time I told it was on a stage in front of 30,000 people. And I have to say, it was quite overwhelming, healing, and incredible. It is the story of my experience with domestic violence. So this is the time for the trigger warning. I am going to speak about domestic violence. I'm not going to go into any graphic details, mostly just my experience and what it was like coming out and healing, still healing, and my whole process with that. So if this is something that is in your heart to listen to, I invite you to cozy up, get a cup of tea. If you know someone who needs to hear an inspiring story of survival, hope, and extreme strength, then this is the show for them. Let's get started. Welcome to Jasmine and Juniper, the podcast. On the show, we explore all the incredible tools I have gathered on my healing journey, from aromatherapy to finding your soul calling, and even starting a business that is perfectly aligned with your purpose. I am your host, Erin Fugate, wellness educator and success coach. Join me for your weekly dose of inspiration, personal development, and learning tools that may support you on your healing journey. Are you ready to be the leader of your destiny? Great. Let's dive into the show. I just want to start off this episode by telling you two points of extreme shame for me, because I just want to get it out of the way and kind of be on mutual ground together. Also, because I know if you're a survivor, you might feel the same shame. My first point of shame is the fact that he is still out there. I did not go to the police because I did not think they would believe me. And he made threats to people I loved and I was scared. And I hold that shame and that guilt with me every day. Because I wonder if I had gone to the police, maybe he would be behind bars and then he couldn't do it to anyone else. A second point of shame is this feeling that I didn't have it that bad. He only did it to me for three months. I got out. I didn't marry him. I didn't have kids. Our finances weren't all messed up. And I know that so many people have it so much more worse. And so much more of their life is taken over by this horrible experience. So there it is. I got that out of my system. And now I can begin. When I got out of this abusive relationship, one of the things that was most shocking to me and still is so shocking to me to this day are the statistics. One out of three women experience domestic violence in their lifetime and one out of four men experience domestic violence in their lifetime. Now, when we think about those statistics, we have to honor all the people like me who didn't report it. So those numbers could even be more upsetting than they are. Now, when I found out that statistic, I felt so many things. I felt anger. I felt sadness. And I also felt like I wasn't alone. As I looked around at the women in my life, and as I still today see women at the grocery store, in the pickup line for school, maybe sitting across from me for a cup of tea, I know that it's very likely that that woman has experienced some form of domestic violence. Now, here's another important thing to know about domestic violence. 
domestic violence is not just categorized as being physically harmed in a domestic relationship. It can be emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, financial abuse, and physical abuse and sexual abuse. So if you are wondering, oh, was I a victim of domestic violence? Am I in a domestic violence situation? If you're wondering, I would really encourage you to reach out to a professional and to get some help. We're going to put all the contact information in the show notes, the numbers you can call, the places you can go where you can get help. This was also something that as I reflect on my experience, I realized that I didn't know. I didn't know where to get help. I didn't know who to go to. And if I had been more well-resourced, I would have gotten out sooner. And I now make it a mission in my life to make sure that my children and everyone I meet knows of the resources that are out there to help. So as I look back, it's obvious why I fell into this type of relationship. I had a traumatic childhood. Both of my parents were addicts and I had a very dysfunctional upbringing. I didn't have therapeutic help and I didn't really understand what my childhood had done to me. And so when I got to be a young adult and I thought I was getting my life together, you know, I got a job. I got into college. I had a car. I was doing all the things. I never thought in a million years that I would be one of those people who got into this type of relationship. And in fact, when I met my abuser, he seemed like the most amazing person in the world. Everybody loved him. He was charismatic. He was smart. He was funny. He was good looking. Nobody could have expected the monster that lived inside of him. When we started dating, everything was great at first. I can look back and see signs. One of the signs was the way that he tried to kind of direct my life. I thought he was just encouraging and supportive. But now that I kind of look back and observe what was going on, he actually was very controlling. He also would tell me how to dress and he would kind of criticize my natural style. So even with those red flags, he was amazing. And I was completely in love with him. It felt so good to have somebody care about me, pay attention to me, take interest in my life and what I was becoming. And I really saw myself being with this man for the rest of my life. I thought I had found my soulmate. I felt like we were going to get married and have babies and that the idyllic dream life was ours. So when he became physically violent, it was absolutely shocking to me. It came out of nowhere. I didn't expect it. And at first, I didn't want to go to the authorities because I loved him so much and he expressed a lot of remorse and he wanted to get help. And I fell for that story, which I think a lot of people do. I mean, if you have never experienced domestic violence, just put yourself in the situation for a moment where you're completely in love with someone. They're amazing. They're everything. In all ways, they're so great. Yet maybe they lose their temper and they do something not only violent, but maybe they raise their voice or they are really controlling or they control the money and they don't let you use the money how you need to use it. There's all sorts of things that can happen kind of as precursors for actual violence that we might make excuses for, especially if they show remorse. And they say that they want to get help. So this is one of the reasons that I didn't immediately go to the police or I didn't immediately leave him at the first sign of violence. He had told me about his childhood. I had a lot of compassion for what he went through and he wanted to get help. 
Now, in retrospect, what I can see is he was making promises of getting help. We would go to the bookstore and we would buy books about anger management and things like that, but he didn't actually go get therapy. And so he kind of was stringing me along and we would have these moments, days, maybe even weeks where everything would be great. The relationship would be great. There wouldn't be any violent outbursts. And then all of a sudden he would snap and something would happen. By the time that the violent outbursts were happening a lot, he had gotten me into kind of a situation where I was very dependent upon him. I would, I had moved to a new town where he lived. I had stopped talking to friends and family. I didn't really have a lot of friends around and he was with me all the time. He also was making threats to people that I loved. So it very quickly escalated into a situation where I wanted out, but I was scared for my life and for my loved one's lives. This is when I really started to learn how to just shut myself down. And I was waiting. I was waiting for my moment to escape. Like I said, in the beginning, I didn't know that there was resources I could go to. And I wish I had, because I could have called somebody, but I felt really alone and kind of my only resource. There did come a point in these three months where I no longer believed that he wanted to get help. I no longer wanted to make it work. I was still grieving the loss of the relationship. I was still grieving the fact that this person that I love had turned into a monster, but there definitely was a moment probably about two months into the violence where I realized, oh, this was never going to change. He was horrible and I needed to get out. And so I just waited for my moment. And the day that he finally left me alone, I didn't know how long I had. It could have been 20 minutes. It could have been four hours. But he left me with this window of time where I could escape. And I did just that. I luckily still had a car. Thank goodness. He had broken the windows to my car, which he had told me he robbed it and did that. But in retrospect, I know it was him thinking that that would make me less likely probably to flee, but I didn't care. I jumped in my car. I drove the five hours it was to get back to my hometown. I really didn't grab anything. So I left all my belongings there. It was my apartment and I was in college. So I just had to leave my classes and kind of forego my financial aid and my scholarships, which was very upsetting. It's still very upsetting today but I escaped. And I'm so grateful that I found the strength and that my guardian angels, my spirit guides, my higher power, all the powers that be kind of came around me and it allowed me to escape. But the real difficult part of being a survivor of domestic violence comes after you escape. Because when you're in that situation, you are in you're kind of in like a shutdown space. You're not really feeling things. You're just in survival mode and you're dealing with all of these conflicting emotions because you love the person. You want to be with them. You want to save them. You want them to get better that when you finally do make that decision to get out, there are so many different aspects and dynamics that are hitting you all at once. You're kind of coming out of shock and realizing what just happened you are grieving the loss of the relationship. You're afraid, maybe afraid for your life, afraid that they're going to find you. And then, of course, there's all that shame that starts to come up. Like, why did this happen? Why didn't I call the cops? Why did I stay? Maybe it wasn't that bad because I wasn't there for so long. So the healing path is a long one. And What I didn't do, and I hope this podcast, I hope me sharing this story is reaching at least one person who's maybe in the same situation. What I didn't do in that moment is understand what a fragile emotional state I was in and immediately seek help. 
I tried to get on with my life. I tried to pick my life back up and get back to school and get a job and start dating again and re-submerge myself into my social circles. But I was such a shell of a person and I was dealing with so much trauma that not having a place, a person, someone to talk to, a therapist to go and work it all out, I shoved a lot of it down inside and it created a deeper wound that now I am still working to heal. And this is over 25 years later. So if you have found yourself in a relationship that in any way feels abusive, whether it's physical, financial, spiritual, emotional, if the person does not have to actually hit you for you to be feeling the effects of a domestic violence situation. So if you think that you're in this type of relationship and you're ready to get out, my number one recommendation is that you immediately get yourself some therapy. Immediately. It is so important. You cannot cover this kind of wound up. It will fester and it will come back to bite you eventually. Whether it shows up in chronic illness, chronic pain, other relationship issues, or just deep depression and sadness. For me, it showed up all the ways. So I had a really hard time in relationships, obviously getting intimate with people, not only romantic relationships, but interpersonal relationships. I have suffered with different chronic illnesses, different chronic pain. And I have battled depression and anxiety because of that wound inside that I didn't take the time to heal when it was first inflicted. And instead I covered it up and it seemed like it was healed because I was functioning. I was okay from the outside. I seemed fine, if not great, but because I didn't really take the time to heal it, I have now had to go back and excavate it and thank goodness I finally got to a point where I was able to attract a relationship. I'm married now with a very sensitive, caring, understanding man who has held that space for me. And thank goodness I have been resourced now where I have found the therapists and the support groups and the tools and the techniques so that I can find this deeper healing. And I'm even able to share my story with you today. But the reason I share my story, even though it's difficult, I got to tell you, like, I didn't want to record this episode. This has been one of the hardest episodes for me to record. But the reason I did is I know there's someone out there who's either listening to the podcast right now, or you're going to share it with them that needs to hear this story because they're either in a relationship that feels like something's wrong and maybe they just needed to hear and validate the fact that, yes, there's something off. Or they have gotten out of that relationship and now they are facing that choice of really dig in and do the healing or just get on with life and try to cover it up. And my hope and prayer for you, if you're listening right now, is first of all, that you understand that you are a victim. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't make this happen. It wasn't your fault. You have been a victim of domestic violence. And it is so brave of you to make the decision to leave. And there are resources and people and services and organizations out there to support you. You just have to reach out and you're going to be okay, but you need to take your healing very seriously. So please find a therapist or healing modality that works for you and do everything you need to do to heal and take the time. This isn't something that you can just bounce back from. This is a really big deal. You, you, you deserve it to yourself to, to honor that time and care for yourself. I hope that I can be a light for you and a beacon of hope that there is the potential to thrive after domestic violence. You do have a whole life ahead of you. You can heal from this. And there are so many people here who know what you're going through, because remember those statistics, they're shocking, they're sad, and they're eye-opening. 
One in three women experience domestic violence in the United States, one in four men. And those are only the statistics that are reported. So I'm going to bring it to a close now and tell you a few, of course, essential oils that I have used in my healing process. First of all, when you have experienced any kind of trauma, especially sexual trauma, romantic trauma, jasmine essential oil is going to be very helpful. If you have experienced sexual trauma, I will invite you to take jasmine essential oil and rub it over your belly every day for 30 days as a part of your healing process. If you are a survivor of any kind of abuse, feeling grounded and safe may be something that's difficult for you. So you're going to want to lean into the wood oils. So trees and barks, anything that smells woody is going to be great for you. And I would apply it to the bottom of your feet every day and then go outside and put your feet in the ground. The third essential oil suggestion, and this will be my last for now, you can always send me a DM on Instagram. I'm Jasmine and Juniper Living over there. And I will help you come up with your own custom aromatherapy ritual. But these are my basic recommendations. So we said Jasmine for trauma, especially sexual trauma rubbed over the belly. A grounding oil like frankincense, Siberian fir, vetiver, black spruce, something woodsy on the bottom of your feet. Whenever you feel kind of like scared or ungrounded, and then you go outside, you put your feet, bare feet, on the earth, connect into the grounding energy of earth. The third is if you get a little sad and a down, sometimes that can happen as we start to recall memories and we start to think about things, this hopelessness might come over you. That's when you're going to want to reach for citrus oils. And I have a blend called citrus bloom. That is my absolute favorite for this. I'll put a link in the show notes so you can buy it, but it just smells like spring. It's so yummy. It's like flowers and citrus and it makes me so happy. Anytime I'm feeling down, I will put that in the diffuser and I will just let that aroma wash over me. I don't know what I would do, what I would have done, where I would be if I hadn't found aromatherapy. Aromatherapy has been such an incredible tool on my healing journey because it is something I can carry in my pocket or my purse. It's a daily ritual that I can engage in that helps me address some of these common concerns that come up for a lot of people that are survivors, struggle with anxious feelings, sad feelings. And it is my life's purpose now to make sure that I get them into the hands of the people who need them. So please reach out. I would love to serve you and support you on your healing journey and get some of these essential oils into your hands. Thank you all so much for letting me share my story today. I can't wait to hear your comments and questions and I'll talk to you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the show today. Did you think of someone that really needs to hear this episode? If you did, please screenshot and share this on social media. Tag me at Jasmine and Juniper Living on Instagram. I would love to hear from you. And please, please, please leave us a review and rating on Apple. This is how more people find our beautiful show. Let your light shine today, friend. The world needs it.